Hey, thanks for not making a start. Uh, if I could possibly pick my very favourite thing about permaculture, it's the deep, deep respect that permaculture has for the world's Indigenous peoples and Indigenous knowledges. And in this part of the world, that wisdom is held on country by the Jaja Wurrung. Do we acknowledge the deep wisdom of the elders of the past, who through thousands of generations of observation learned good land care practice? We acknowledge the present elders engaged in sharing and teaching knowledge within their own communities and also within the broader community. We acknowledge the emerging elders, those who are building skills and will carry their culture through the generations to come. I'm not really sure how I can introduce David Holmgren without sounding like a big silly fanboy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not even going to try. Oh my God, it's David Holmgren. <laughs> so I'm very lucky. I was introduced to permaculture ethics and principles about 30 years ago. I've been even luckier to have been able to develop two properties in my lifetime along permaculture principles. 30 years of working in libraries, being surrounded by environmental information has certainly helped too. David is the co-originator of, of permaculture as a concept. His original thesis developed into Permaculture One, published in 1978. I've read hundreds of definitions of permaculture and I still struggle to really define it. But the best sentence I can come up with is, you can get everything you want for a decent life and fix the world in the process. The shorter my introduction, the longer David will have to speak and the more time you will have for your questions so prepare yourself for some serious inspiration and give a warm welcome to David Holmgren. Great to be here uh, in Bendigo in person to talk to you about permaculture. And I suppose it's relevance in really pandemic times that we sort of seem to be to some extent settling into. So my partner Sue and I have travelled from Meliodora, our home of the last 35 years on the edge of Hepburn. And of course that journey has been all through Jajora Wurrung country, that like the rest of Australia was never ceded by the Indigenous people, despite being displaced and dispersed in the 1840s by the squatters and from the 1850s by a surging population exploiting what people in this town would probably know was the richest gold region <coughs> in the world. And that wool and gold contributed to Australia becoming by 1900, the richest country in the world per capita. So we acknowledge that complex legacy uh, in all that we do and further afield, including this and other presentations around the world, always by saying where we are uh, from. So doing so online has been not such a big thing for me because I decided not to fly back in 2007. Um, so when the uh, COVID came, uh, yeah, it was a little bit of a change, but not so much. I've been batting away invitations to go to conferences on the other side of the world, actually dating back to the late 80s because I couldn't necessarily see justify going to the other side of the world just for, for one event. thing. And I suppose it's a bit like uh, we used to say, uh, collapse now and avoid the rush. So change your behaviour ahead of the world needing to change. And then it doesn't sort of seem so bad when it happens. And the way things are going, future invitations to come as far as Bendigo might depend on uh, a wood gasifier powered vehicle if we want to avoid the uh, global corporate transport solutions. And rather than being abundant and freeing, are likely to be one way or another more of a straitjacket. So we'll come to that, I suppose, that living with uncertainty. It's all part of the global shared experience in which we apply permaculture ethics and design principles to both broad acre land use and how people can be more gainfully 
uh, resettled in our rural hinterlands. But my strategic focus over the last two decades has mostly been on the low density residential areas around our capital cities, regional towns, and even uh, small towns like where we live in Hepburn. And in this presenting our retro suburbia strategy, I trust that you'll find something useful, whether you live in an apartment, on a farm, or even in a vehicle. So I like to explain permaculture as a design system for resilient living and land use, rather than just a cool form of organic gardening. And while the strategies and techniques vary with place and context, the foundational FX and design principles govern, guide and inform those strategies and, and techniques. Permaculture design can be applied to most areas of life and work. And the permaculture flower organises the scope of permaculture action into seven domains. The domain of land and nature stewardship including gardening, animal husbandry, forestry, all of those sorts of activities is the primary domain from where we learn the design principles in a working relationship with nature, which we then apply to the other domains that are simultaneously needed to redesign for a regenerative and equitable society. But at the household level, we simplify that to three fields of action the built, the biological, and the behavioural. So retro suburbia is a pattern language for retrofitting the built, biological, and behavioural fields of suburban households, governed and empowered by permaculture ethics and, and design principles. I think COVID has highlighted the importance of the household non-monetary economy as a strong base to support us when the monetary economy fails for whatever reason. And I think it's shown us that actually a fair proportion of the monetary economy is actually unnecessary and inefficient in providing for needs that can actually be done at home. Yes, the uh, subscription to the gym or going to the cafe or the dog shampoo service that we uh, avail ourselves of, you know, they might all be added to affluent society. But I think a lot of us could see actually they're not really necessary. The tragedy is that actually a lot of the really necessary stuff is totally controlled by globally interconnected corporations. And what COVID has also shown is that a lot of the discretionary economy is still managed by humans, small business people. And so there's been this double-edged sword that uh, COVID has allowed people to realise, hey, we can do a whole lot of things for ourselves at home that we don't actually need to do in the monetary economy. And that commuting each day to work, school and entertainment has been shown to be unnecessary for many. But I think the more subtle learnings are that multi-generational households and larger households are the ways that most people survive and thrive challenging times through history. And even before COVID, in the years after the GFC, which hit the United States very, very hard, average household size was going back up. I'm not talking about house size, talking about how many people live together in a functional household. Now, of course, people coming together in that way is not necessarily out of choice, but more out of necessity. But I think COVID has shown that single person households are incredibly inefficient and often lonely places without the support of the commute and consume economy. Because all of our social needs are also met in that way, because if there's just one of us, often you know there's not much at home, and maybe us on the couch. 
So I want to talk briefly about the lineage of this retro suburbia focus on the household level. So permaculture was conceived in the, in the mid seventies, a decade before the sustainability concept was popularized. And in the early years, permaculture was really mostly applied by individualistic pioneers, commonly focused on self-reliance in rural environments. And in Australia and many other countries, those projects included horticultural and architectural innovations in both household scale and intentional design community contexts on what planners call and architects call greenfield site, starting from scratch on a path. You know, where we're going to put the house, put the road and the orchard and whatever. So since those years, permaculture has grown and evolved into a worldwide movement across more than 100 countries with many different expressions and evolutions. And some have suggested that permaculture may be Australia's greatest uh, intellectual export. So one of those evolutions was the transition towns movement. In 2005, Rob Hopkins, uh, the founder of the transition towns movement, was a permaculture teacher and activist living the back to the land life in the Hollies community in rural Ireland when he invited me and Richard Heinberg and a whole lot of other people to a conference there called Fueling the Future, which was part of a, a, a six month teaching and study tour that we, were, uh, we did in, in Europe, um, organized around that uh, Europe and North America. So transition took off with Rob's move to the small town of Totnes in Southern England. And transition in Britain, Australia, and other countries around the world it's been about community building and resilience in existing, mostly urban localities in response to the looming threats of climate change, peak oil and economic contraction. You know, it focused on the people side of permaculture while often using projects in the built and the biological fields to achieve those ends. So that sort of focus was urban um, and very sort of community focus, whereas that first stage was very sort of the individual, sometimes with a family in tow, a rugged individual going out and doing things. So over the last decade, Retro Suburbia has been building on the lessons of the permaculture pioneers, intentional communities and transition towns to empower households to achieve their potential to live well now on less while building resilience in response to the accelerating and compounding challenges. So retro suburban households are the essential building blocks for relocalized economies and self-governing communities. Now, while this perspective is in a way often self-evident to those from a more socially conservative perspective, you know, family first, the, the family, the household, this is the foundation of society. Um, the household levy, on the other hand, is often underplayed or even unrecognized by those provoking progressive green left perspectives on society, uh, on society wide solutions, where people often think of themselves as the individual and then they're in their community, which is of course really important. But what's that middle step? Everyone lives in a household of some sort. So in framing retro suburbia in this way, we are being more inclusive of a broader spectrum of values and beliefs. And we've noticed this on permaculture design courses and uh, all sorts of other courses uh, that some people are enormously engaged by uh, collective activity and working bees and getting together to do things. And other people just want to go and get on with something in their own corner and feel really intimidated by all those things. And it's, it's very interesting also when we worked at series at the start of series in the early days, I noticed the difference in culture between uh, the product people who are focused on an outcome, just get something done, and the process people who, well, it's how we make the decision and 
how we get there and is there a really important thing, not what we actually do. And of course, both those things are important, but they're very different sort of personal cultures and, and collective cultures. And we need all, all of those uh, things, of course. So why retrofitting? Most of the buildings in which we will face very different futures have already been built and will have to be retrofitted to suit. <clears throat> and that just doesn't apply to buildings. It uh, to, uh, applies to our gardens, landscapes, and of course, most powerfully to our behavior. So retrofitting can work through a live-learn cycle that's less dependent on scientific research, regulatory approval, or bank finance. You know, try a little thing here, see how it goes, um, rather than sort of very large projects. And so a pattern language of design solutions to recurring tensions and dilemmas helps create harmonious and functional habitats. In Australia, I expected the bursting of the property bubble would trigger the second Great Depression that would force rapid growth in retrofitting and adaptive behaviours for more home-based living in larger shared households. So far, unprecedented government spending, uh, phenomenal debt and the lowest interest rates in the history of money have kept the property and stock market bubbles afloat. By the way, I date the start of the Australian property bubble as being 1983, two years before uh, we bought a death home. It's how long we've had this disconnected rise between uh, property values and, um, uh, and real economic underlying potential. But uh, the pandemic induced home isolation also triggered an explosion of household self-reliance so large that it actually overwhelmed the supplies of seeds, tools, uh, and information. And we saw that with a second wave having uh, launched the Retro Suburbia book in uh, 2018. And then there was a sec second massive peak in interest uh, in the book uh, uh, in around March, April, May 2020. And that's when we actually decided to put the book in an online form on a pay what you feel basis. Still not saying that it was a real thing, but it uh, made it um, a lot more accessible to, to more people. So as the sense of emergency faded in Australia and the incentives to renew consumption and indebtedness grew massively, many people have given up the gardening and other expressions of household self-reliance. But I think for a minority, COVID has been a wake up call to deepen and extend those strategies. And a growing sense of disquiet and resistance about the emergence of permanent track and trace monitoring of people, work, travel, consumption restrictions, censorship of dissident perspectives on media and social media has most obviously led to some political activism, but it's also led to many people prioritising autonomous, informal and non-monetary ways of providing for material and social needs. And now the war in Ukraine, the global food, fertiliser and fuel prices, and sort of existential angst about a, a, the growing climate emergency is starting to undermine faith in a return to what people once called normal. I think more and more people can see the need to act in their own enlightened self-interest. And that it doesn't matter whether you believe in climate change or not, whether you accept the narrative about Russia being the cause of the looming economic problems, or whether you're vaxxed or not, that we all need to get our act together at the individual, <laughs> household and the community scale, seeing what we have in common rather than focusing on who's right and who's wrong. Because we are in a time from my sort of big picture historical perspective where there's an enormous 
conceptual confusion about what the hell is going on in the world and what does it all mean and what needs to be done. And unfortunately, they're arriving at a consensus about that is highly unlikely anywhere. That's what history teaches us when we're in these times. In the end times of Rome, there were many, many groups that all knew the system was failing and was false and wrong. And some were fundamentalists and said, we need to re-worship the old gods again. And others had all sorts of different solutions. A lot of them have been lost in the dustbin of history. Uh, there was this other little group called the Christians. They seem to end up having a bit of a influence as it turned out. But there were many, many people all understood the system was wrong, but it didn't necessarily arrive at an agreement about what, what to do about it. Uh, so we need to a bit accept that, as I said, this uncertainty, huge uncertainties about that. So why suburbia? It's where most people in Australia and similar countries live and have grown up. It's a sort of a sweet point where there's a lot of resources, e.g. biological and built uh, ones that, and also the possibility of replicating solutions where someone can actually copy what was done down the street because they're actually on the same soil, their house has got the same orientation uh, or whatever. And that sweet point between the capacity for autonomy and access to resources that we associate with rural areas and the connectivity and exchange uh, and human possibilities that we associate with cities, with genuine uh, sort of urban density development. And in a lot of ways, suburbia is that sweet point. And COVID has highlighted the advantages of suburbia compared with the city stacking, lower infection risks, but enhanced community interaction, um, fewer lures to spend and consume, more space for home-based work and self-reliance, and more autonomy in infrastructure and options for retrofit. All of these retrofitting possibilities are possible in high density cities, but they require, they're very technically complex and they require a lot of stakeholders to all agree about something needing to be done and huge regulatory and bank financing things. Whereas at suburban level, a lot of things people can just get on with uh, something. Okay, so the first section of the book goes in, introduces the concept of resilience, energy descent, climate change, financial bubble burst. Pandemics and the responses taken by government are just one of the many wild cards that expose the vulnerability of our monetary economy based on global supply chains. And although the emergent details of COVID are unique, they illustrate the broad terms of my brown tech energy descent scenario, in which crisis breaks the faith in government forces, of market forces to provide solutions. And this leads to whether by prior planning or by emergence to a command economy. That's what we used to describe the, the, the economy in the Soviet Union in the, in the Cold War where national governments use and strengthen legal and extra legal powers to reshape the economy and society. However, governments in doing that depend on the global corporations to implement this stuff because they don't actually have the capacity anymore to do that much themselves. So they, the corporations then implement these crisis-driven programs which build on the already long established pattern uh, that was identified in the 90s uh, called disaster capitalism. When capitalism starts making money more from things being destroyed than from, from the sort of creative positive things. And whether those disasters are due to uh, natural disasters um, or whether they're due to um, conflict or, or many, many other things. So making money from crisis and dysfunction. So while this, this context can be alarming in its implications, it only reinforces the logic of the retro suburbia uh, strategy. So we use this household form and location matrix to assist individuals and households 
navigating the options to collectively survive and thrive challenging times. So two tensions create four solution spaces that are more or less relevant to us, depending on our personal circumstances and our stages of life. So the first tension on the horizontal axis is the, between the incentive to migrate to somewhere new, where better future prospects might be, or to consolidate our resources and knowledge in the place we know. So it's on the horizontal axis. And then the second tension is between the will and capacity to develop and control a personal household and co or communal space versus the imperative to accept unfolding realities by adaption, including resigning work, selling assets. Um, so that's on the, on the vertical axis. So this creates four solution spaces. And the first is perhaps the classic retro suburban response, consolidating often in a, a multi-generational family home um, with substantial resilience retrofits and productive gardens. We call this solution space family castle. And I'm sure people have seen the film The Castle, uh, which it's a little bit of a nod to that in a way. The second solution space uh, is called communal living. And that provides a greater degree of collective organization and control over the living and working and productive environment that might involve migration to a new location and people coming together in some sort of community. So co-housing, eco-villages, mostly in rural locations are now inspiring new communities retrofitting existing urban, suburban, and rural properties, and just adapting what already uh, exists. You know, like a bankrupt rural tourist enterprise or, or caravan park that a whole bunch of people just buy and it becomes a community. So again, although it's not the classic retro suburban solution space, it's using some of the same sort of logic. Oh, there it is. There we are with the, the communal living with the, uh, the pizza. <laughs> Renaissance little drawing. Okay, the third space we call mobile minimalism. And there's the little tiny house on wheels. In Australia, characterized by young people who might be network nomads migrating with the seasons and connecting to uh, different like minded uh, people that might be in these other two solution spaces. So they might be visiting and going between uh, some of those. And then the fourth solution space we call adapt in situ, staying connected to familiar place and community while adapting to change, whether that comes from outside circumstances or internal ones such as aging. Put on the, the jumper, adapt. So together, these four solution spaces com comprise a community of complementary life ways that can be mutually supportive. Because it's also these two upper ones that have the social and organizational capacity to perhaps help individual older people who might be someone living down the street. And as I said, the younger people who might migrate and help uh, in different seasonal conditions, add to those uh, households, uh, but actually be uh, on, on the move. So we can see where that this may be a sort of like a life cycle to some extent too, where young people start over there and then as they start to focus on what they're on about, some project, some way to make the world better, and then in middle age with children, um, well, we need to consolidate and accept realities and then the drift down in older age to um, simplify. Of course, that's a bit artificial and arbitrary, but there's different ways that this tool helps people think about what's their situation. And there's been, there's been some interesting discussion on the Retro Suburbia Facebook page about people getting 
some more people getting really, really seriously concerned about where is a safe place to live, especially people in the Northern Rivers region of New South Wales that have been through floods, bushfire, more floods, more floods, and are going, holy hell, is this actually where we should be living? And some very nuanced discussion about that, and it actually coming back to actually, um, uh, in a lot of ways, it's the community connection which is more important. And of course, the book that we published, the only novel that we've published, uh, 470 by Linda Woodrow, set 10 years in the future in the Northern Rivers region, is a lot of what's been unfolding in that region is graphically and amazingly described in that, in that novel and all of the social complexities uh, uh, of that. And it's sometimes through fiction uh, that we can sort of uh, better understand those things. And so it is with uh, Aussie Street, which is a story I've been telling for more than a decade, now recorded as a chapter in Retro Suburbia and an animated presentation uh, that we've done in many locations. So it traces the life of four adjacent houses from the 1950s, including migrants from Italy and the Netherlands through the second, through to the second Great Depression of the 2020s. Now, some people think I must have had a crystal ball, but the crystal ball was pretty foggy. <laughs> uh, so if you want to see that, uh, me presenting that story and answering questions from a, a crowd of 250 uh, at Maui during the early stages of our retro suburbia roadshow in 2019, you can visit the Retro Suburbia uh, website. But that story was also my attempt to sort of a bit poke fun at a lot of the academic and policy discussion around urban planning and urban densification that's been going on for the last uh, 40 years. Mo most of my life, actually since I was in design school in Tasmania in the 70s. So up until the turn of the millennium, Aussie Street follows the pattern of more built space, housing fewer pet residents who spend more time away from home using public infrastructure and facilities that cover over more green and productive space, all accelerating greenhouse gas emissions. And then after the permaculture pioneers of retro suburban moving, the numbers improve uh, somewhat, laying the groundwork for Aussie Street being a model of sustainability, resilience, and livability in the 2020s. So I think the pandemic has shown how commuting is unnecessary for many people, that larger households and retrofitting unneeded commercial real estate could solve the Australian housing crisis without the need to infill suburban backyards build over more agricultural land or create more high-rise developments. It's very hard to get any traction in the debate about the housing crisis. It's, it's such a shocking reality that we actually have enough buildings, even for a growing population. We just uh, need to share them, retrofit them, and actually use them. Because most buildings are actually locked up at least for most of the day, not used. And that's only possible because the underlying value is seen to constantly go up. If that was going down, then the only value of a house is its use value. You have to use it because you end up having to maintain stuff. But that's overridden in our uh, experience by those other things. So Aussie Street is now a picture book told from the perspective of one of the children in each decade of the story, written for the eight to 12 age group. It teaches the lived history of ordinary Australians in meaningful ways that empower the next generation to transform their, their home and street with or without the adult's approval. We're big on encouraging people to just do things, including kids. So uh, happy to um, push the boundary in those ways. 
So the 10 chapters of the, the built field cover shelter, heating, water, waste, and other non-living aspects of the home environment. This beautiful yurt sits on a suburban backyard as a movable tiny house. And there it is. Um, Button on the top. Unless it's turned off on the side, could be. <laughs> Okay, you can see the green roof of the yurt there. <laughs> um, and uh, oh, it's reflecting up the screen, it's not even going to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that dotted line is where the fence has been taken down between the neighbouring properties. Um, and the arrow points to uh, a gate through into the neighbour's property. So this is in uh, Heidelberg uh, West. I think in cool Southern Australian climates and even climates like Bendigo, uh, greenhouses added on to the sun side of a house are one of the best ways to reduce winter heating needs, grow early seedlings for summer and create half indoor, outdoor living spaces. I think it's perhaps one of the most iconic permaculture retrofits for cool climates that can be adapted to with variation to other uh, bioregions. And it led to me identifying one of the patterns in retro suburbia as being south facing to the street. Because often in a lot of suburban houses, there's sort of bedrooms and bathroom and laundry along the, the back side of the house facing into the um, into the backyard. You've often got a brick veneer wall that's thermal mass outside the building, putting a greenhouse like this, exactly as that drawing from the book shows, uh, is actually sometimes a, a better retrofit than doing those sort of things on the front side. And especially where there's regulatory controls on heritage and, and stuff where you can't modify the, the front. And there's yeah, lots and lots of different reasons why that um, so that counterintuitively identified that, oh, actually houses which are south facing to the street often have this uh, greater possibility. And often it's easier also to control the sun access in a slightly larger backyard than in a house where there might be large street trees that are uh, blocking the sun and things that you can't do anything about. So a lot of these have been sort of the deep learnings of seeing what what works over a, a long period of time. <clears throat> and I think outdoor living much of the year in Australian climates can strengthen the connection to nature, reduce the hold of media technology on children and reduce the sense of crowding. It's really interesting that in my childhood and earlier generations, the way people coped with what by modern standards would be crowding was parents said, get outside, go away, play, go and do something else and don't come back to them too. <laughs> uh, rather than kids being all bottled up inside a house that is sort of driving people nuts, that leads them to say, we need more space. <laughs> so outdoors is, is, is really important to that. There's another finding in that that we found that when you uh, have very intensive garden farming in a backyard, it's not suitable for ball games and stuff like that. So kids were out on the street because that is a robust landscape, which is actually suited to all those activities. And of course, that is also part of David Enkwick's amazing work on traffic coming. Get the kids back on the street and all the cars slow down. I mean, people are a bit shocked at that strategy, but this is literally how the traffic went faster and faster as no one is around and there's there's no activity, the reoccupation of the street. And someone was telling me the other day that their grandparents' uh, garden in the northern suburbs of Melbourne when they were kids, you definitely couldn't play any ball games. There was all delicate trellis beans and tomatoes and, uh, and you know, it was a very highly productive garden and they played on the street. So these, these basic learnings, we can uh, recolonize uh, the public space. 
So I think um, COVID has also highlighted how much safer and healthier it is to be outdoors, even ignoring the benefits of vitamin D from exposure to sunlight. It's actually been shown to be both a protective and recovery uh, factor in, in not just uh, COVID, but in fact, all um, uh, viruses. And in fact, uh, one of the things that showed up in, in that is huge swathes of the population, especially in urban environments in high latitude countries, like in Europe and North America, are actually just habitually vitamin D deficient. And if you're a black person, it's actually really high. Like in places like Chicago, 80% of black people are vitamin D deficient, which makes them incredibly vulnerable to disease. And if you're a black person in Sweden, you need to be taking a lot of supplementary vitamin D. Mostly in Australia, if we actually get out and, you know, in the outside, it's mostly not a, a problem uh, for us. And cooking with wood is one of those things, reasons for being outside. It rekindles our ancestral relationship with fire, reduces dependence on centralized and high tech energy, and it can be carbon neutral and done in ways that are very fuel efficient uh, with minimal smoke. And this metal uh, drum cook stove is even simpler and quicker to construct than a rocket stove and almost as fuel efficient and smokeless, just burning small stick fuel. Now, the current geopolitical tensions have highlighted the importance of energy as well as food self reliance at the household, community, bioregion, and national levels. Unfortunately, the environmental mainstream promotion of the all electric household ignores the need for resilience and backup systems. And it makes us more dependent on high tech solutions from global corporations. So of course, a lot of these things bring the problems back home. What about the pollution aspect? Yes, a lot of permaculture is about doing things again and taking responsibility rather than pushing the problems away, saying, oh, they, they don't exist, buy them going away somewhere else. It's actually better in a lot of ways to bring the problems back home and deal with them where their source is. And one of those ways is just that very, very simple technology which is what was shown in the previous photo. Now, the biological field covers growing food, raising livestock, other biological aspects that make for an abundant and interesting uh, living environment. Um, and I just wanted to sort of highlight the plumbery as a good example of potential productivity of garden agriculture at the smaller end of the suburban scale, because Cat Labors has actually kept records of everything that comes out of the garden, which is kind of pain in the ass to do, actually, when you go and stick some herbs and, and whatever. And despite the limitations of soil contamination and uh, pest animals in this permaculture design system that includes quail, bees, feeds the household the majority of their fresh food needs while uh, generating a, a surplus of barter. There's her figures that we included in the, in, in the book. But yeah, in 2018, it, it went up to 428 kilos, 2019, over 500 kilos, over half a ton of food from 100 square meters of, of productive space. Now, she runs sustainable gardening programs and like uh, government is uh, a permaculture teacher, but she is very diligent about sort of mapping all that. And she says a few hours a week produces that. Uh, food using permaculture and organic methods of soil, plant, and animal husbandry. So even if that's not the level we're at, that shows the potential, which is you know pretty uh, extraordinary how productive we could be. And of course, animals as part of the system provide a focus for children, being, build an empathetic connection uh, to nature while providing services, manure, and of course protein rich foods. And it's really interesting to note that during the, the Great Depression of the 1930s, Australian working class people with insecure tenure often kept animals that could be fed on weeds and wastes collected from common land, uh, where they didn't, and they could take animals with them if they lost, you know, their, their, their rental uh, place. 
where it was actually middle-class people who grew uh, vegetables and especially fruit, uh, fruit trees. And the pioneers of retro suburbia are out reviving this use of the commons to boost backyard food production in what might still prove to be the second Great Depression. So trees, uh, I will leave the pretty rangy guinea pig house design uh, from uh, Retro Suburbia. Um, but I wanted to um, uh, emphasize the, the tricky issue of trees because they're important elements, but they require management and in some case removal and root pruning, uplift pruning, uh, stem girdling, polleting uh, and mounded or wicking beds are all options for containing vigorous food trees like figs and, and mulberries in suburban uh, food systems. But while the climate and environment benefits of trees are well known, there's also can be conflicts. Large evergreen trees, especially eucalypts and pines, can be particularly problematic if they're not well located and managed. And often respectful reuse is the best option, especially in the leafy suburbs where trees and wildlife uh, that live in them can prevent food production. And also as we get into drier and drier environments like Bendigo, we all know that big trees like that can be enormously sucking, especially where the soils aren't very deep so there's not capacity for the deep taproot trees. So a lot of gardeners say in central Victoria that you can garden under a red box tree because the deep taproots don't come up to the surface and, and, and destroy your garden, but almost any other eucalypt, they will respond to the watering nutrients and come up and just eat everything you put on. So it's a, it's a really uh, tricky one. And finally, the behavioural field is the big one that addresses everything from home-based lifestyles and work, finance, raising self-reliant children, sustainable food habits, decision-making and conflict, health, ageing, disability and death, all the hard subjects. There's even my take on vaccination, which of course was written before the pandemic. And I, of course, have reread that. Um, <laughs> Laura said, oh yeah, I'm still happy with what was said there. Um, that's all uh, stood up reasonably well. Um, but the thing I want to emphasize is this, most households being too few people to cover all the skills of self-reliance, deal with crises and be economically efficient. A lot of people know how it's just as easy to cook a meal for five people as it is for, for one or two. A lot of the self-reliant aspects actually want economies of scale a little bit bigger again. Running a backyard chook system, yeah, it's often better if you're sort of feeding or supplying about 10 to 15 people rather than, you know, one or two. Um, and so whether that's at the household scale or it's through exchange in the neighbourhood, um, and larger households can form in many different ways, including extended family, shared purchase, taking in borders, and living carers. I think the eating locally and seasonally with less processed and packaging would be a healthy shift uh, addressing, um, again, one of the ignored factors in resilience to COVID and all other health challenges, uh, the problems of obesity. And for the average Australian, this means more veggies, less dairy and less meat. We took that further in the book and looked at the the retro suburban diet, not as a prescription, but as what we believe might be the average of what people would be consuming and where that food could come from in rebuilding a bioregional food system for at least 10 to 20% of the population that is motivated to do this over the next decade. Because the centralized system will still be there if it's the last thing government will do it's make sure that the shelves in Moles and Bullies are not empty. Because after that, that's the end of the nation. Defend the borders and feed the population. So that centralized system is going to be supported, but 
the straitjacket of being in it and the disadvantages of being in it will just gradually get tighter and tighter. Um, so I think it's unrealistic to wave a magic wand and say, all that centralized system is going to be transformed, reformed, but we can build a parallel food system which can show what is uh, possible. And in our bioregion, I believe it's possible that suburban garden farming and wild harvesting could provide 25 to 30% of a diverse, healthy diet, while commercial intensive urban and peri-urban agriculture could provide a similar proportion. And then bioregional hinterlands are best able to provide the remainder, especially grains, legumes, and um, products from larger livestock. So if you're interested in that larger vision, which is well beyond what we can actually do at home, uh, this um, uh, small ebook uh, is downloadable from the Retro Suburbia website, feeding Retro Suburbia from the backyard to the bioregion. And there are a lot of other readings and resources on the Retro Suburbia website. We've built it as a, an ongoing resource base. There's more case studies than there are in the book. There's a, 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 a Retro Suburban Real Estate Evaluation uh, Checklist. There's many uh, resources there. Uh, as well as uh, other ones that we will add a, as we uh, can do that. And hopefully this is giving you a taste of how some Australian households are downshifting to deal with current and future challenges while enjoying the opportunities for more time with family, friends and nature, enriching neighbourhoods and a sense of security and hope uh, about the future. Thank you. I think the first thing I need to ask people is did my definition stand up? Just about everything you need or want while saving the planet. <laughs> David, are you happy to take questions? Definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. Great. Uh, so just raise your hand if you want to have something to ask. I wanted to ask, um, have you ever seen a, um, a garden under a red box tree? Uh, yeah, I mean, mostly sort of tough, uh, tougher yeah. uh, plants. But I think that is true to some degree. I sort of regard the red box as almost like the indigenous equivalent of an oak tree. The canopy is often very dense, so that can actually mean that sometimes growth is restricted by just the density of shade. They just mm -hmm. seem to hold that density of foliage and often less eaten by insects than a lot of the other eucalypts. But the, that very strong taproot character and the leaves seem to build up a compost soil, which is almost, you know, that again, most eucalypts don't really do that. Um, but yeah, it's still things like pruning up, uh, sometimes trees, you know, can be pruned up and you can let more sun in and get advantages of, oh, there's a place to have winter plants um, uh, out of the frost, because you've got canopy overhead, but the winter sun is coming in under it. And then if you say, oh, no, it is too dry, there's too much competition or like an, another eucalypt. Oh, could we have things in tubs in that situation where yes, we've got some shade in the summer, which might not be such a bad thing, but we've got that winter sun coming in. And again, high pruning can sort of allow that. So there are a lot of different design solutions as we understand how to, how to work uh, with trees. Do you have any solutions for the garden or natural solutions? Or uh, yeah, it is a, a real tricky one. Um, uh, I have, I suppose, been in a little bit in denial in Hepburn about that, even though I've been expecting it for decades that it, that it would come. And it's just starting to even arrive as, as far south as we are um, occasionally. Um, I think talking to David Arnold, um, who has a very good permaculture property, small uh, olive grove and production fruit 
uh, system. He's found that he is abandoning some of the commercial production of certain difficult things, but other things quite surprisingly, like figs that are really vulnerable to it, but they're only vulnerable when once the sugar is in the fruit and that fruit needs to be picked anyway the day before it's ready to eat, which is why fresh figs, of course, are so expensive to buy. And he can pick them, keep them chilled and sell them before fruit flies is possible. But other fruits, some of the early stone fruit is saying is giving up on. At the domestic scale, most people seem to be looking at the close woven netting exclusion. So that works well where you're talking about small gardens with very compact managed trees um, and where you've got the ability to individually net. It doesn't work so well where you've got uh, dense, small sort of food forest type systems because mm, do you enclose the whole thing? And we've got designs in retro suburbia for enclosed gardens against pest birds and and uh, animals, especially possums, that sometimes it makes sense to actually uh, build anti aviaries But whether you then go and say, okay, well, I'm going to have insect excluding things, because then you're excluding all your beneficial insects as well. So there are obviously some management standard management tools and baking and different things that are, are sort of acceptable under organic standards. And, um, Sort of reasonable to do, but I don't have any magic answers on that. But it's definitely that chooks under fruit trees are one of the partial controls of things that are eating fallen fruit. And sometimes, ironically, which is also a partial control on cotton and moth, but we found in that problem with premature falling apples and having dozens of, of, of trees in a larger orchard. It's our vegetarian geese, which are the better control on the codlin moth, because they're gobbling up the apples and in the process, you know, getting the, the codlin moth that might be in them. Whereas the chooks, you know, are overwhelmed by a whole lot of fallen semi-ripe apples. So, um, and yeah, there is that general pattern that, that animals that will, you know, Eat those small things are part of them. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, you know, the probability of you know, future blackouts um, and fossil fuels. I just wondered what your thoughts were on high battery systems. Yeah, I think as a resilience option for some people when they've done a lot of other things, they do make sense. But it, I suppose it depends on how dependent on electricity we are at the start. If you actually look at the, the strategy that is a lot of it being promoted of all electric, um, everything electric, then you say, well, yes, um, this needs battery backup. If we've got like in our food preserving strategies where we don't do any bottling or drying or fermenting, and we put everything in the freezer. And you've got the big freezer running, yeah, you really should have battery backup because there's so much that sort of at stake. Whereas if you said, okay, well, we're mostly into you know drying, bottling, all the more traditional ways of preserving, and we just yeah, we have a few things in the freezer, or maybe we only have a, an ordinary fridge freezer then that importance of the backup, it still might be important, but it, it shifts back down the scale a bit. So whether there's likely to be any major drops in price, I reckon we've, my guess is we've probably had the drops in price um, fr from battery. It's, and so that means if they look like they're workable now, then that, that may be quite a good investment for uh, many people. But for the more essential things, um, like running freezer, like communications systems, or there's also other 
even at the wood energy scale of things. A lot of people are looking at uh, way more efficient zero pollution um, pellet or uh, stoves uh, that have got fans and computers in them that need that little bit of electricity to actually work. And so, like I was talking to um, uh, my stepdaughter in, in, in Belgium about that, and I was saying, like, if you're going to get something like that in your climate, because they're facing, you know, the next winter, there's going to be shortage of gas in, in Europe almost certainly. Um, you know, make sure it's either a simple thing or you've got at least a little battery backup that can actually run the piece of equipment. So there are a lot of sort of ins and outs of what have we got? Um, and then there's all the complexities of the market thing. Okay, we've got all this solar and we're not getting any money for it. You know, if we were storing it, that's actually helping the system. It is helping stabilize the system. So, but we've got also got to compare, okay, not just what was the dollar cost, but what was the environmental cost of making those batteries? And at least in Australia, we could say, I suppose with the 100% renewable rollout, we will have a lot of lithium mining here and other stuff. We're one of the big suppliers. But overall, you know, the situation in the world is as Elon Musk said, we will coup whichever countries we need. We will change the government to take the resources to get what is needed for the, you know, the equivalent of what's been done with oil. What is being done with copper, uh, lithium, um, cobalt, um, neodymium, all the, the rare materials that are needed to, to make these complex technologies. So, you know, there's things are not as green as they appear to be, but that doesn't mean to say they're, you know, they're not bad. It's a bit like the way I've always treated fossil fuel. If you're putting fossil fuel in a bulldozer and doing really well-designed earthworks to capture water and improve the productivity of a landscape in a way that could future generations could even maintain by hand, that's an incredibly good use of fossil fuel. But if you're just getting in the car to drive down to the shop to, <laughs> to pick up something and drive back, you know, that's a really poor use. So that whatever we use and invest, it's sort of like, is it is the use in use balancing? But yeah, I think um, home batteries, uh, you know, are part of the equation. Sorry, I couldn't give you a no, yes or no <laughs> answer on that one. <laughs> Yeah. I'd like to ask about retro that particular the building across the street, the government hub. What would your opinions be on why is it that all political people, that are all levels of government, think it's perfectly okay to knock over substantial buildings and replace them with monstrosities? Yeah, well, we were getting, when I suppose, few decades ago before the the property bubble really super accelerated it seemed to be there was a, a tipping back to spend more money on labor and reuse buildings or sometimes reuse materials and then we had a huge acceleration towards just to smash everything down and uh, put up the next thing and i think the uh, the fact that existing buildings are devalued relative to the underlying land value is the big corrosive thing behind a lot of it. I think the second thing is that retrofitting always involves more labor, more skill, less sort of like production line um, systems that the corporations can deliver and guarantee exactly what's going to come out the other end. So it's a sort of a slower, more uncertain process, or there's individual characters in a building that, oh, well, this needs to be considered here. 
And so it's the opposite of what our economy is designed to do. Um, and, you know, you can see examples where when bureaucracies attempt to do that, like in our shire of Hepburn, they bought uh, a building that had already been modified and retrofitted, but then said, no, we'll gut the whole thing, having already paid way too much money for it. And then the whole sort of disaster uh, un unraveled. Now, whether that would have been less so with a new building, we, we supported that, you know, adapt. If you're going to build one of these bloody great hubs that local governments everywhere seem to decide that they need it simultaneously. Um, not quite sure where all that agenda actually sort of came from. But uh, yeah, the retrofitting is, I believe, the building industry of the future. But it may come about with the sorts of things that we're now getting with global supply chains and massively increasing costs. So the fact that a, a stick of radiator pine, 90 by 45, it used to be $6 a metre, is now $10 a metre. Suddenly makes things like, oh, gee, when we pull down that stud frame wall there with those old hardwood studs, why don't we reuse that? <laughs> or, gee, that tree that's, you know, we could get a portable mill and cut that up. And, and so all those things, the, the economics start to change. Now, there's, of course, at the larger scale, there's a lot of impediments to that. Oh, that timber you're cutting up on the portable mill, it hasn't been graded. So you can't use it in this new building. But you might be able to use it in something you're uh, adding or um, doing to your house a little bit under the radar. <laughs> you know, so the larger we go up into those systems, they're all to a degree into a, a huge degree of, of, of locking. Um, but I think it's part of, you know, things becoming harder to do in any sort of functional way at a larger scale. And the, the costs seem to, uh, you know, become ridiculous. But returning to that point of the underlying land value, I worked out that in theory, a, a developer with the current planning potential on our two and a quarter acres at Meliodora, that could have townhouses all over it, that a developer could theoretically buy it at maybe its market value, bulldoze our passive solar house, the second house, the tea house, our 180 fruit and nut trees, all our irrigation systems, wipe out the dams, barrel drain the creek, and do the development and sell it for townhouse lots and make about one and a half million out of it. So that ability, you know, that the land is, is what's gone up in value so much. That means what you've done on the land is worth nothing. It's actually just that land value. And so it's always this turnover. You know, that site is what's theoretically valuable, wipe out what's on it. And of course, that is an insanity, which is completely a nonsense. And if those land values are going down, then suddenly you say, what is the use value of this building? How can we use it as it is or, or, or change it? And I think that that world is coming, but it will come in very, very harsh ways, obviously, for the, uh, the main economy. But I think that that is the future of the building industry, is those who can retrofit things, and that means it will be small business, skill-based, skill rather than, you know, production line based. Then we look at, if we get a halving of global international trade, and it doesn't matter what causes it, whether it's the cost of fuel or geopolitical conflict, the amount of shipping containers there are in terms of shipping container housing, it's mind-boggling. So it's not a simple equation, although I acknowledge that the, the 
Uh, universal government policy of encouraging migration has been one of the big factors since the end of the Second World War in achieving constant uh, growth in GDP in Australia. But the other big factor is to take the activity that was already happening in the households and communities on monetary economy and suck it into the monetary economy. And I'm claiming that 50% of the growth in GDP in my lifetime is actually just as bad. So when people started buying their lunch at work rather than bringing their lunch from home, no more lunches were created. It's just that they've got monetarised. So the purpose of the economy is not to provide needed housing or meet needs. It's actually to drive GDP growth and give a bigger share to government and corporations. That's what the purpose of the economy is. And so that's what my retro suburbia work at that large level is economic treason. I am preaching economic treason. I mean, you're not preaching economic treason. <laughs> well, in the conventional it's sense, that's what it is. Half the growth of GDP is because people are, are now not doing things at home, and whether it's making lunch or, or looking after the kids or fixing something, and that's happening in the monetary economy. And if it's better for each people individually, better for society and better for the environment to move at least some of that activity back into the non-monetary economy, then we can do that and we can call it economic growth. And so that means I'm pro-growth. <laughs> it's just, just trying to show the absurdity of a lot of these discussions. The problem is, young people are slaves because they got a mortgage. Yeah, and so that's, that, that's what, that underlying. That's the, this economy is based on slavery, <coughs> and slavery is young people starting off with a family. Yeah, so I, I mean, our, our strategy so, is say if we can't change the larger structures, we have to do that hard look at our situation and say, okay, what are, we, what are we going to do about protecting ourselves? And then for a lot of cases, as we said, for people uh, in retro suburbia, sometimes it's around things like connecting co community and starting the veggie garden, but sometimes it's saying, hell, we need to sell this house in, in the city and move to a country town and get a similar house with a much lower mortgage, or we need to actually move to a smaller house, or we need to work out how to share house. You know, that sometimes it, it requires that we actually take some hard decisions to sort of protect our long-term interests, rather than saying, hey, they should do something about this if the evidence is that you know, that's either not going to happen or it's going to happen by chaotic processes, which also can be high, high risk. So, uh, and I think the difference between now and say the 1930s is that the terrace house that Sue and I used to rent in Garton Street in Carlton, I think in the 1930s, there were about eight people living in it. You know, so to say to those people, hey, you need to share your house with more people. Sorry, it's full. It's like getting more people in the mini minor. You know, whereas we collectively in Australia, we do have a lot of options. And that's the really positive message if we choose to take them and, and work out how to, how to make those things. We all need to wrap up now, so it's just start from your home. <laughs> um, David. Thank you so much. Um, I was inspired. I'm one of those permies who lives on a property out in the sticks. So uh, much as I love the concept of reinvigorating suburbs, uh, it might be, might be my children rather than me doing it. <laughs> uh, folks, thank you all for coming. Uh, Sue is at the back uh, with books for sale. I'll go and see if there's anything we need to add to the library collection. And David, again, I'd just like to say thank you very, very much. Quite a few of the books out 
at the back of it if uh, you don't want to or are unable to search it, including Retro Suburbia, are available in the library. I can guarantee tomorrow there'll be lots of reserves on it, so there might be a little bit of a wait. Uh, there's almost always reserves on Retro Suburbia. The way we measure success of a title in the library, one of our main measures of how many times it goes out and what the reserves are like since publication is definitely a winner. It's always out of the library. You never find it on the shelf. Um, but you know, if, you're if you're happy to queue up and wait for it, it will get to you eventually. Oh, we've got more copies for the library. <laughs> yeah. The library needs more copies. Yes. <laughs> That's an option too. Uh, and can I just uh, give uh, a little spook, especially for, for those who are uh, online and not at our uh, travelling bookshop, um, our online bookshop and our distribution system is there working and working with uh, good bookshops but we are actually almost unique in book publishers that we refuse to participate with the big online um, Amazons of this world and where it may be uh, a sort of a David and Goliath task and it may not work but we actually follow those permaculture principles a fair share in trying to operate that way within the book trade. Um, so for people to go and support those systems, um, because you won't actually find our books actually in those large systems, which is, and that's the reason, because we, we don't let them have them on any other terms than what anyone else can have them. And of course they don't accept that. <laughs>